Okay, great. Maybe um, I will get us started and then people could continue to join um, as we go. So welcome very much, everyone. This is the final session of our spring seminar series uh, focused on improving care for people who inject drugs with endocarditis. Um, the session today is our last one. It's focused on antimicrobial treatment decisions and pick lines for people who inject drugs with endocarditis. And we're very grateful and fortunate to have um, Drs. Victoria Weaver and Duncan Webster with us today uh, speaking. Uh, so just for a bit of background, this seminar series um, is brought to you by uh, an emerging national working group uh, focused on injection drug use associated endocarditis. This is our first um, public facing project. If you're interested in joining the group uh, moving forward, focused on educational or research or clinical stuff, feel free to, to send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat box in a second. Um, and I'll uh, introduce myself. M my name is Tommy Brothers. I practice internal medicine and addiction medicine in Halifax, and I'm currently a general internal medicine fellow at Dalhousie uh, University. Uh, I'll be your moderator today. I I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And this territory uh, where I live and work is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq first signed with the British Crown in 1725. And these treaties do not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but actually recognize Mi'kmaq title and establish the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. And we are all treaty people here. Um, so first, uh, I will would like to introduce Duncan, Dr. Webster. Um, Duncan graduated from Manalison in 1993 with a BSc in chemistry, biology, and physics, and a BA with honors in philosophy and religion. He completed a master's degree in philosophy at the University of New Brunswick and graduated from Dalhousie Medical School. He completed internal medicine uh, residency and infectious diseases fellowship at the University of Alberta uh, before returning to Dalhousie for medical microbiology fellowship training, which he completed in 2007. He then returned to his home in St. John, New Brunswick, where he continues to work as an infectious, infectious diseases consultant at the St. John Regional Hospital through the Department of Medicine with a cross appointment in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. He's an associate professor at Dalhousie University and an active teacher within the Dalhousie Medical School. Uh, as an infectious diseases physician, he has clinical and research interests relating to chronic viral infections, including hepatitis C, as well as harm reduction. And Duncan helped to establish a not-for-profit multidisciplinary clinic serving marginalized people who are at risk of harms related to substance use. Uh, the RECAP Clinic is located in Uptown St. John, New Brunswick, and has been serving the community since the spring of 2014. So uh, I'll invite Duncan to share his screen and um, we'll save questions for the end after both Duncan and Vic's presentations, but feel free to post them uh, in the chat box and uh, I will keep my eye on that and keep track of them for um, the end. So welcome, Duncan. Excellent, yeah, thanks so much, Tom. I really appreciate that. Uh, you can hear me okay? Great. All right, well, it's, it's a real honor to, to have the opportunity to to uh, present today on this important topic. Um, I'm going to try to get through this in about 20 minutes so that uh, Vic will have a chance to, to speak as well. Um, so I'll just start as well by acknowledging that I, I live and work on the unsurrendered and unceded territory and traditional lands of the Willistiquay, which uh, follows the, the Willistic River and the watershed and honored to, to live and work here. In terms of disclosures, um, the only disclosure that I have is that uh, I am a founder and board member of, of RECAP, as Tommy had mentioned, I'm actually at RECAP uh, today in clinic. And we serve a number of the individuals that uh, uh, are at risk of, of endocarditis related to injection drug use. So across the country, we all have our story in our own local setting. And so we've had the chance to look back at our uh, New Brunswick and, and, and specifically Southern New Brunswick experience. And like, like we're seeing across the country and, and many parts of the globe, rising rates of endocarditis and uh, certainly endocarditis related to injection drug use. So it's certainly a, a very relevant uh, topic to be talking about. I'm gonna try to talk around uh, a few cases. These are, these are hypothetical cases, although we'll uh, sound very very familiar to a number of cases that we've all seen uh, throughout our, our careers and will likely continue to see for the, the time uh, ahead. So first of all, if we can imagine a 37-year-old woman who had been admitted to hospital with injection drug use-related endocarditis, 
And after some time in hospital, uh, things are unraveling a bit and there's concerns about leaving against medical advice. So in this setting, this individual has uncomplicated tricuspid valve endocarditis, secondary to methicillin sensitive Staphylococcus aureus. So, you know, I guess the question is what, what would we do in this case? What's the evidence? What do the guidelines say? And, and what uh, in, in the real world setting would we uh, think about doing? So that's one case. Um, I'll, I'll mention as well that when I'm looking at these cases, I'm looking at this as an infectious diseases physician. We had a great talk from Dr. Weimer uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, this is a, one of Weimer and Group's publications. And you'll see the multidisciplinary team that's involved in the care of these patients. And, and as the infectious diseases consultant, what they've got here as, as the job of the ID consultant is, is very much in line with what I'm thinking. I'm thinking when I'm seeing this, this individual, what antibiotic should she be on and how long should I treat for? Those are really the, the biggest questions that I, I need to try to address. So if we take that first case and, and adjust it just a little bit. So let's very similar scenario, except that rather than having just sole tricuspid valve involvement, now imagine that there's also left-sided involvement. So tricuspid valve and aortic valve involvement, same organism, same scenario. So what, what are the options here and what could we do? A third case, again, very similar setting, uh, but let's just switch it up, switch up the pathogen. And instead of talking about methicillin sensitive Staph aureus, we've got uh, polymicrobial infection involving serration marcescens and candida albicans. So we're gonna go through some, some background and then at the end, come back to these and just think what, what would be options and, and what sort of things could we consider? So in order to determine that, we want to think, you know, what, what's going to be reasonable? What's going to provide uh, the best care for these individuals? And what, ev what evidence guides us? And what other clinical factors should be influencing our decisions? In terms of guidelines, there's three key guidelines. There's the, the British guidelines published in 2012, the European Society of Cardiology guidelines published in 2015, and the American Heart Association guidelines endorsed by the IDSA, also uh, last updated in 2015. Okay, so first case. So coming back to this individual with uncomplicated tricuspid valve endocarditis secondary to Staph aureus. So looking at the guidelines. So the first thing that we'll notice when we look at the guidelines is that, yeah, this is not an unusual scenario. We, we see this far too often and right-sided endocarditis is most frequently observed with people who inject drugs. So the PWID co cohort. And Staph aureus is certainly the most common uh, pathogen in this setting, and MRSA uh, prevalence is increasing. When I see cases associated with endocarditis, you know, many my, myself and many colleagues included, this is this is our go-to. We go to the the tables, in the guidelines to give us that guidance that we need. And when we're looking at a case like this, native valve endocarditis caused by Staphylococci, so Table Ten, we can see that. You know, cloxacillin is the, you know, cloxacillin or cefazolin by intravenous for six weeks is the, the recommended uh, approach. However, there is a caveat in the comments that notes for uncomplicated right-sided endocarditis, a short course two-week therapy may be appropriate. So what's, what's the background there for that short two-week course? So looking at the European uh, Society of Cardiology Guidelines, the, the reference here is, is a, a study from 1996. It was an open randomized study out of Spain looking at 90 uh, consecutive uh, cases of Staph aureus uh, tricuspid valve endocarditis amongst injection drug users. And uh, you can see that two weeks of treatment, sorry, I, I apologize, not, not all injection drug users, but two week treatment with uh, cloxacillin um, is sufficient. We used to add in the aminoglycoside, but that's so no, no longer a, a thing. And the American Heart Association also would reference Ribera as the, uh, as the key study to back up this approach to two weeks of IV cloxacillin monotherapy. That would, be, that would be the ideal approach. Now, vancomycin, important to note, not a good idea to use for this short and two-week course. Both the European guidelines as well as the AHA note that vanco has limited bactericidal activity. It's not going to penetrate well into vegetations, and drug clearance may be increased in the PWID population. So not, not a great go-to. 
Daptomycin is another thing that could be considered. The American Heart Association references a couple studies and, and notes a, 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 a dosing of six milligrams per kilogram per day. The European Society also uh, note that daptomycin is a consideration, although recommending higher doses. And often some will combine it with another agent, uh, such as cloxacillin or phosphomycin. So bottom line is that current evidence suggests that either the parenteral beta-lactam, so cloxacillin or cefazolin, or daptomycin short therapy, uh, short course therapy could be an option for a case uh, like we've described. But in this case, I guess the issue is that this patient is, there's concerns about her leaving against medical advice. So is IV going to be, a, you know, can we set that up? Depends on where you're at and how much work you've done up to that point to try to get things set up. But the, the question of oral therapy is going to come up. Is, is oral therapy going to be an option? So the British guidelines note that there's not a lot of data to help uh, support oral therapy. But also note that there's lots of times or certain times when you may have issues with obtaining or maintaining IV access. And the PWID population is certainly one of those settings. And so oral treatment may be the safest option. And so although not a lot of great data, it, it is something that is noted as, as being important and reasonable at times. The IDSA guidelines talk about oral options. So there's a, a four week antibiotic regimen that's been studied. There's two major references here. So the Dworkin studies out of the uh, University of San Francisco, it was small numbers, uh, just 14 uh, individuals, 10 of whom completed a uh, four week course of ciprofloxacin and lefampin. The Heldman study out of John Hopkins is, is much bigger. And in that study, there were 85 individuals who had um, uh, criteria for right-sided uh, uh, uncomplicated endocarditis. And in both of the studies, the cure rate using ciprofloxacin and rifampin oral combination was greater than 90%. So there's, there's some good data to back up that uh, statement in the guidelines. So the dosing, 750, 750 milligrams twice a day of ciprofloxacin, along with rifampin, 300 milligrams twice a day. Obviously, there's some caveats there. We want to make sure that the strain is susceptible to both drugs, make sure the case is uncomplicated, and uh, ensure that the patient can adhere to the, uh, the treatment. Okay, so a bit of the, the, the guidelines, I would say, give us some help in terms of making some guideline-based decisions around treatment in that first case. So what about the second case? So again, very similar to the first, but instead of having uncomplicated right-sided endocarditis, we now also have uh, aortic valve involvement. So what do the guidelines tell us? Well, the guidelines tell us that when you've got left-sided involvement, really you need to use that standard four to six week uh, intravenous regimen. That's what the guidelines would tell us. So looking at table 10, I mean, this is, this is uh, the go-to, although we recognize we've got challenges in this case, and to try to get this person through six weeks of intravenous therapy may not be uh, realistic. So we'll come back to those cases, but case three, uh, the guidelines tell us that when you've got polymicrobial infections, uh, things really uh, are, are a bit different, a bit more complicated. Certainly this is becoming more of a common issue we're seeing rising rates of polymicrobial infections involving right-sided endocarditis. And where we've got, even if it's solely right-sided and we've got organisms other than Staph aureus, and in this case where we also have left-sided involvement, the guidelines don't differentiate between people who inject drugs and those who do not. The, the guidelines um, find a paucity of data to really support doing anything different for this cohort. But again, leaving against medical advice, what, what can we say about oral therapies? So the British guidelines touch on this. They note that there is oral therapy options that are gonna be appropriate at times. And if necessary, we wanna make sure that we're gonna select the right antibiotics. Oral bioavailability is obviously critical. And we need to make sure that um, patients can tolerate these medications and they can get good absorption. And examples that are noted would include uh, ciprofloxacin, linazolid, and rifampin. 
obviously for a gram negative uh, infection, ciprofloxacin would really be the only option of these three listed. And uh, there's nothing there in terms of, of yeast, but uh, fluconazole is, is something that, that would certainly come to mind for, uh, for an ID clinician. So, okay, that's fine. That's the guidelines, it's helpful. You'll note that the guidelines, the last updated guidelines of those three, two of them were published in 2015. So I wanted to see what else has come out since that time. So I was able to uh, get some support from our regional St. John Regional Hospital librarians. And we posed this question. In the setting of infective endocarditis related to substance use and injection drug use, what's the evidence pertaining to? And the two key things I'm looking at here very similar to what uh, Dr. Weimer had suggested an ID consultant's role is, is what antibiotic? So oral versus intravenous. And how long? How long should we treat for? So the search essentially is outlined like this. We look, went back for 10 years. We looked at endocarditis and search terms to identify the right cohort and asked the question around antimicrobial therapy. So we searched PubMed as well as Embase. In PubMed, we found 46 articles. 28 were uh, easily rejected just on quick look, uh, too general, not focused on the question. And then 18, we you know, thought, well, we better have a, a little more of a closer look to see. In, um, in Embase, we identified nine articles and then six we uh, had a closer look at. So this is just a, a quick look at the references, those that are uh, bolded were the ones that I did a more thorough review. And for the PubMed references, there's the MBASE references. And I'll just mention a lot of these studies, when we did look through them, we found that uh, although great articles and you know were good design and whatnot, they did not answer this question specifically. So as an example, this study looked at uh, cost effectiveness but again, I'm, I'm asking the question, I want to determine what are my options for using oral versus IV and how long uh, can I treat for? So again, a lot of these studies just didn't help answer the question. Nice study from our Toronto colleagues at St. Mike's looking at uh, a, a eight year period, 39 cases. Again, good, good data collected, some important uh, things noted in terms of the role of, of surgery and prevalence of staph aureus. When I looked at supplemental table uh, S4, it appeared that all of these patients received IV antibiotics and very much in line with guidelines. So awesome. And if you can pull that off, that's great. But we all know there's going to be situations where that's not going to be uh, so viable an option. So uh, Dalba Vanson, uh, another nice article, uh, notes the role that it may play. Again, not a lot of great um, studies yet to promote this for its use in endocarditis, but being a, a glycopeptide with a half-life of over 14 days, it is something that in a crunch, we may find a value uh, to give us a little backup when we're worried about somebody uh, leaving or having poor adherence. Um, this uh, is an important study um, looking at a case series out of Pittsburgh. I think the biggest thing that came out of this was the recognition of partial oral antibiotic therapy. So in this, case, in this study, there were nine uh, cases complicated by injection drug use and median duration of therapy for 23 days. And that idea of starting with IV and then switching to oral antibiotic is something that's really growing and some data is, is, gather, is uh, gradually increasing. The next study from that PubMed search brought up a really fantastic interactive article from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, published recently. Uh, it looked, uh, it kind of, the, the discussion was around a 33 year old gentleman with substance use disorder and aortic valve injection drug use uh, associated endocarditis who was leaving after two weeks of therapy. And although this doesn't bring out any new data, it reviews a lot of really important findings. First of all, noted that um, this inability or difficulty with remaining in hospital, hospital for a prolonged period of time amongst individuals who struggle with substance use is not uncommon. And a quarter of, of patients uh, in, this, in this large study uh, 
372 patients, a quarter of them left hospital before completing recommended courses of therapy, and a third didn't finish their full course. So it really is an important uh, issue. I think one of the big things that this that the Chowdhury study brings up is the POET trial. So the POET trial has made a lot of waves in, in the past couple of years. It was a large randomized controlled trial out of Denmark looking at left-sided endocarditis and partial oral treatment was found to be non-inferior to full course of IV treatment. And importantly, in this study, which had good numbers, injection drug use was not a criteria for exclusion. So again, really relevant uh, article, potentially. Because when we dig down into the POET trial, what we find is that uh, four, 47 patients had staph aureus endocarditis and, uh, and received oral therapy. Noting that the patients in this study were really closely followed with two to three outpatient visits uh, per week, uh, sorry, two to three outpatient visits, uh, yeah, per week while receiving oral therapy. The oral treatment after initial IV treatment was non-inferior to the intravenous treatment alone. And with long-term follow-up that actually went out for a median of three and a half years, uh, it, again, it, it, it showed no negative outcomes. So it sounds really promising. Now, again, when we drill down and look at the data more closely, only 47 involved staph aureus, and only two, in fact, only two patients actually uh, were, with, were injection drug users who were assigned oral step-down therapy. So we're not sure actually that this may be so applicable to, uh, to the patient population we're discussing. But on the other hand, maybe, maybe it is. It is noted that the POET findings are not licensed to discharge PWID uh, population with pills and minimal follow-up plans. It's really important to arrange things and have things set up nicely. A couple other uh, important caveats that come out of this New England Journal uh, interactive uh, article. They do mention that Rifampin, which is one of those drugs that is going to be important as oral therapy, especially with the Staph aureus infections, it, it does have strong interactions with methadone, which a lot of these patients will be on. It will really drive down methadone levels, and people can develop withdrawal if not adjusted. Linazolid, another important uh, oral option uh, in combining uh, with methadone, there's a risk for serotonin syndrome. And of course, we, we've got QT prolonging issues with uh, fluoroquinolones which can be worsened with people already on, on methadone. Um, the, the other things that are really important are, are issues around the patient and making sure that if they're going to be discharged on oral therapy, we need to have things in place. The psychosocial and socioeconomic factors need to be considered stable housing, addiction treatment, medic, medication coverage, and we need systems. We need systems in place that are well supported and the follow-up after discharge can be ensured and we can make sure that people are doing well outside a hospital. So just moving on, so I can give uh, Vic uh, a turn here. I'll just note that there are, were some more great studies that again, just didn't really quite answer the specific question that I was looking at. What, so oral versus IV, as well as the duration of therapy. Now I will just mention, there's a couple great review articles uh, that I would say would be key documents, but nothing new really to pull out of them. And when we come to the MBASE references, again, not uh, some great studies, another one by our Toronto colleagues, good study, but doesn't answer the question I'm looking at. And I'll just mention a, a last couple um, uh, articles. This is a really great review article in the Swiss Medical Weekly and uh, it notes the importance of oral antibiotic treatment, um, but that it's, it, although the data is scarce, there is growing evidence that initial IV treatment can be followed up with oral therapy and the setting of staph aureus infections. And in terms of the gram negatives, in addition to the oral quinolones, there's note of oral trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, which has also uh, got excellent oral bioavailability and is bactericidal. There's some great tables in this document, checklists for using oral antibiotics in this population, some tables to help guide uh, dosing of the antibiotics and with some, some uh, comments that are relevant to the antibiotics. And if you're looking at a specific pathogen, what are oral options? So really great document. And I'll just mention lastly that th this, is, this is another really great study that looked at the population and compared three groups 
full course antibiotic treatment, a uh, partial course of antibiotic treatment with no antibiotics upon uh, leaving against medical advice, and partial course of IV antibiotic, then oral antibiotics when discharged against medical advice. Good numbers of individuals with endocarditis in this study, and there was really no difference between those who received IV antibiotics and those who were stepped down to oral upon discharge. So while the data, I couldn't really suss it out to say which antibiotics and what duration, I think it does give more guidance in terms of providing some decision-making uh, data. Um, and there are also some studies out there that, again, while they don't clearly answer this question, looking at the sort of data that's collected and the cohort of patients, there's probably primary data sets out there that could be further mined uh, to help answer these questions specifically. So in terms of oral versus IV and the duration of treatment, what's new for this po population outside of what the guidelines tell us, I think the big thing is that partial oral treatment may be a thing even for this population, although we do need more data. So just to end off case one, you know, we've got options here. We want to give cloxacillin uh, or cefazolin intravenously, but in the absence of being able to do that, there is some good data to say the fluoroquinolone rifampin combination could be used. For case two, uh, now complicated with left-sided involvement, staph aureus, six weeks uh, is really what we would target with intravenous therapy, but you know, putting in the PIC and setting up outpatient therapy can be complicated, and maybe partial oral therapy is a thing here. Case three, uh, now we've got this gram negative and yeast uh, polymicrobial infection. And I guess the things that come to mind where there really is not a lot of great guidance for this population would be, you know, is, is ciprofloxacin and fluconazole prolonged course something that should be entertained? Or are we really suggesting no, intravenous is really the, the important way to go, maybe once daily or dependent on mycofungin, in which case we need a pick line, and we need to consider the difficulties that may arise with the PICC line. So having said that, thanks to people who have supported me through this uh, presentation. And with that, we'll move over to Dr. Weaver, thinking about what we may want to do uh, about that PICC line issue. So I'll stop sharing here and pass it over. Thanks very much, Duncan. I uh, really appreciate that deep dive into the literature and also uh, the focus on being pragmatic and thinking about how to support the whole person uh, within a system rather than simply the antimicrobial choice. Um, so we will, there's been some great questions in the chat box and I'm collecting them for discussion at the end. Um, but uh, so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Victoria Weaver. She's an infectious diseases and addiction medicine physician in Vancouver, British Columbia and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at UBC. She's currently a research fellow with the International Collaborative Addiction Medicine Research Fellowship through the BC Center on Substance Use and the US National Institute on Drug Abuse. She trained in internal medicine at the University of Calgary before completing her adult infectious diseases fellowship and addiction medicine training at the University of British Columbia. And Dr. Weaver has a special interest in improving the quality of and access to treatment of serious bacterial infections in people who use drugs. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much, Tommy. And, and thanks, uh, uh, Duncan, for that excellent talk on, on oral antibiotics. So we'll chat a little bit about um, PICC lines. And uh, before getting into that, I too wanted to respectfully acknowledge that I am here as a humble and uninvited guest on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, and just invite everyone to sort of, you know, take a minute to think about whose homelands you're calling in from and uh, ways we can honor that and work towards reconciliation in our everyday lives as citizens and as healthcare providers. Um, in terms of disclosures, I have, I have no relevant disclosures. Uh, as Tommy mentioned, I work as an ID and addiction med doc in Vancouver, um, and I'm currently finishing um, my research fellowship through the BCCSU and NIDA. Um, so in terms of learning objectives, uh, we'll chat a little bit about what PICs are and why they're used. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the risks of PICC lines and how those might change for people who inject drugs, uh, what the evidence tells us, and sort of what comes next. So what can we do um, as care providers um, with this knowledge? So what exactly is a PICC line? So PICC stands for Peripherally Inserted Central Catheter. 
And PIC lines are a type of central IV, which allows for longer term, more durable venous access than a typical peripheral IV, which you might have placed in your hand or in the inside of your elbow. Uh, but it's not quite as extreme as something that's surgically inserted, like a Groshong line or a Hickman, which might be used for like dialysis. Um, they're generally placed by specialized vascular access teams under ultrasound guidance, and they can be single, double, or triple lumen, the lumens being these sort of access points at the end here. And that depends on the indication that they're being placed for. They're about 50 to 60 centimeters long, and they go into one of the veins in the upper arm, and they go all the way through, um, and they terminate at where the SVC, or the superior vena cava, bringing blood back from the top half of our body, uh, meets the right atrium of the heart. And so... Uh, for those of you who are maybe more used to looking at chest x-rays, this is just sort of a, a plain film chest x-ray. So you can see the outline of the heart here in red. Uh, and then you can maybe appreciate coming in from the right-hand side is the pick line here. And you can see just the end of it sort of ending right at the top of the heart there. So why would a pick line be placed? So there's generally sort of three broad reasons why a pick line might be placed. Um, the first is for provision of medications or therapies. And this can be for things like chemotherapeutics or intravenous fluids, or um, like in this talk, things like long-term uh, intravenous antibiotics. Uh, PICC lines also often allow for blood to be drawn for lab investigations, which saves people a venipuncture or a poke to get that blood work done. And they might also be placed in patients whose veins are otherwise unsuitable for peripheral IVs. So they've had a lot of venous trauma uh, from things like repeated injection use or dialysis or if they're receiving a medication that might be particularly damaging or scarring to the veins. So we know that anytime we place foreign material in the body, there's going to be certain risks associated with that. Uh, and PICs are no different. Um, this type of venous access in and of itself is associated with certain risks, and that's irrespective of injection drug use. Uh, these risks depend on the type of device being placed, how many lumens it has, where it's being placed and why. So for example, patients who might be having a PIC line placed for malignancy may be more likely to have clots. Um, PIC risks are also dependent on whether patients are being treated in an inpatient or outpatient setting. Uh, there's a number of studies that look at the risks of PIC lines in different populations. And I think it's worth noting that overall, there's a lack of like large randomized control trials that compare the rates of these complications to those for standard peripheral IV access. But broadly, the literature sort of breaks the complications down into three main categories. The first is that of bloodstream infections, uh, which based on the literature happened with an estimated frequency between less than one to 6%. Um, and these are thought to be introduced by the PIC line itself. Uh, the second is thrombosis or the formation of a blood clot. And these happen between two and 15% of the time in studies that specifically were done not looking for thrombosis. Um, so this was in patients who weren't necessarily found to be prothrombotic or more likely to make clots. And the last major risk is that of malpositioning or dislodgement. Uh, and in the literature that's quoted at up to 9.3% as compared to central lines, which might be in the internal jugular or subclavian veins. In terms of the risks that providers are most worried about, this 2018 American study from Rappaport et al surveyed 672 ID practitioners uh, via an online survey, and they were asked to rank their potential concerns providing ongoing parenteral therapy for people who inject drugs. Uh, they were asked to take these options and arrange them from the things they were most concerned about to the things they were least concerned about. Uh, and most patient, most, sorry, providers answered that ongoing illicit drug use via the PIC line was their number one concern. Uh, this was followed by drug overdose or death, inadequate follow-up, socioeconomic factors, and any medical legal concerns. And a lot of this is borne out sort of in the literature. And so when we're looking at the literature and trying to think, like, what does the evidence tell us about this? Um, there are a moderate number of papers that have been published looking at PIC lines in people who use drugs. And because this talk is not nine hours long, uh, I'm only going to highlight a few of them. But what I will say when we're looking at these papers and the evidence they provide is that it's important to consider two specific things. And the first is who is writing these studies or who is controlling this narrative? Uh, and the second is what audience are they writing for? Um, and I think that becomes important and evident as we move through the evidence. A lot of the evidence for PIC lines comes from the OPAT world. And so uh, Dr. Webster mentioned OPAT, which is outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy. So it's often the placement of venous access and then long-term intravenous antibiotics outside of the hospital. 
Um, and the Infectious Disease Society of America does put out guidelines on OPAT, the recent one being from 2018. And the most recent one suggested that there was insufficient evidence to make a recommendation for or against treating people who inject drugs with OPAT at home and decisions must be made on a case by case basis. Uh, but looking at the evidence, you wonder like, is there really insufficient evidence or like what evidence is there? So one of the most widely cited studies is this 2018 literature review from Suzuki et al, which appears to be more of a scoping review rather than a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, they looked at 10 studies that encompassed 800 individuals who received OPAT specifically. Eight of these studies were retrospective and nine included patients with endocarditis. And that was the second most common infection in this uh, paper after bone and joint infections. And all of these patients had durable venous access with a PICC line. Um, thinking of the previously mentioned sort of concerns, um, seven of the studies actually describe OPAT completion, and that was between 72 to 100% of patients completed their OPAT courses, which is pretty good. Um, and only four studies actually described pic related complications. Uh, and this included line infection, thrombosis, or dislodgement, which were all kind of like lumped together. Uh, and lumping all of those together, there was between 2.7 and 9.4% described complications. And if you recall, like the rate of infection in all comers is between one and 6%. Thrombosis is two to 15% and malpositioning is up to 9.3%, which is fairly consistent with these findings and suggests, you know, maybe people who inject drugs are not actually experiencing increased complications with PIC clients. Um, four of the studies described PIC misuse, which is in quotation marks because I think that's a relative term. Um, and that was between zero and 2% of patients in the four studies uh, that described it were found to be misusing their PIC. And this was often on the basis of provider suspicion, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about after. Two studies, including one out of Singapore from Ho et al, actually went to like very extreme lengths to reduce the risk of misuse, including security seals over all of the valves and the ports of the PIC lines. And another study used tagoderms to cover all of the potential access ports with daily inspection for evidence of tampering and prompt switch to oral therapy if there was any evidence found. A more recent Canadian study specifically looking at um, risk of new bloodstream infections in people who inject drugs with endocarditis um, came out of London, Ontario. So it was a retrospective cohort study that was done between April 2007 and March 2018. Um, and they analyzed patients by disposition. So whether or not patients remained admitted to hospital or received their therapy through OPAT. Um, they found 420 unique episodes of endocarditis in 309 individuals. Uh, and there were new bloodstream infections in 82 of those 420 episodes. And they define new bloodstream infections as a microorganism or bacteria in the blood that was different than the one initially leading to treatment for endocarditis and was not felt to be related to infection anywhere else in the body. And so that's tricky because as we know, folks have many reasons to develop a secondary bacteremia. And we just said that PICs themselves carry between a one and 6% risk of bacteremia. Um, and additionally, patients in hospital, as we've heard in all of our previous talks, may still be injecting drugs and they may still be using venipuncture to do so, which is also a risk for bacteremia. And so I've cropped some of these tables from the original paper because I wanted to highlight a few specific data points. The first being physician documented inpatient drug misuse, um, which is never actually defined within this paper. And so it's hard to know if that's on the basis of suspicion or not, particularly as only 45 of these 69 patients had uh, confirmatory UDS. The other question is, it's hard to know what the role for confirmatory UDS or urine drug screening is in these patients because 100% of them were prescribed opiates. And as you'll notice, most of them used opiates. Um, lastly, only about a third of patients in the study actually received any consultation to inpatient or outpatient addiction medicine, which I think is quite telling. Interestingly, uh, this study found a higher rate of infection in those who remained hospitalized compared to those who were treated on an outpatient basis with an incidence rate ratio of 1.84. Um, also in their multivariable regression, inpatient addiction medicine consult was actually found to be associated with a significantly lower rate of new bloodstream infections, which certainly kind of makes us think that ongoing inpatient drug use is probably the result of a need that's not being appropriately met. Uh, briefly, this is a recently published paper that highlights a few additional studies and provides a really succinct overview of some of the more recent evidence. And one of the things that this paper points out and that is notably absent in all of these studies is any patient perspective. 
So a lot of these studies are heavily focused on potential harms from PICC lines, which can be very significant, um, but very few have focused on potential benefits of PICC lines or the patient experience of having them. And I do recognize, you know, a lot of these were undertaken in an American setting where things like the risk of litigation or the perceived risk of litigation may be greater. Um, but I did want to point out two recent Canadian papers that uh, do a good job of addressing this gap. Um, the first is a paper from Gouda et al. in 2021 uh, called With a Pick Line You Never Miss. Uh, and this looked at 50 qualitative semi-structured interviews done as part of two larger studies throughout Ottawa and Toronto that sought to examine how substance use impacts hospitalization from both the patient and the healthcare provider perspective. Um, they talked to 26 healthcare workers and 24 persons with HIV or Hep C who had lived or living experience of drug use and hospitalization. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the most valuable points of this paper is these very candid quotes from patients, which directly describe sort of benefits from having PICC lines. So this patient called Stephanie notes, you know, I didn't get any open wounds. And that's my team's concern about me is, is that I get wounds. Um, another patient notes that they had left with their PICC line. And one of the thoughts they had is like, I'm never going to get another abscess because my veins are so hard to hit. And with a PICC line, you never miss. An additional more recent study uh, did qualitative semi-structured interviews with 25 inpatients at a large Western Canadian hospital to try and describe inpatient experiences and motivations to inject either drugs or diverted medications into vascular access devices. And this is part of a larger study that evaluated provision of sterile injection supplies to hospital inpatients. Um, similar to the paper from Brooks et al, or from uh, Guta et al, um, a lot of these patients describe benefits to PICC lines, which has also been discussed you know, in our previous sessions um, with Tally and with Natasha. And I think that's largely missing from the literature. So you know, one patient describes how you know, in the morning when they're experiencing withdrawal, it's so frustrating. And, you know, having a PICC line sort of improves their chances that they might actually be able to, you know, manage their own withdrawal. Um, the authors noted that most of the participants interviewed here refrained entirely from injecting into their vascular access devices once they learned of potential risks or if they'd experienced any serious harms. They also noted that patients had limited knowledge of how their vascular access devices worked um, and several were unaware of how to inject properly into them. One person interviewed felt that staff should proactively teach patients about the risks associated with injecting into their VADs, saying that, you know, we should show folks how to do it properly, like show them how to use the flush and show them the process. Um, but despite this, in this study, only one person actually described a discussion with staff regarding the practice of injecting into their vascular access device, whereby it was suggested that intramuscular antimicrobials would probably be given for the entire course if they uh, were found to be injecting into their vascular access device. And so, you know, studies like this, um, while most of the available literature is focused on pick related risks, these sort of studies really focus on some of the benefits, which I think are largely underreported. So, you know, the presence of a pick line may actually decrease harms by preventing injection into higher risk veins, like the jugular or the groin, um, or decreasing the risk of skin and soft tissue injuries that might be the result of repeated attempts at venipuncture. It's also super important to remember that folks usually aren't coming to the hospital to have their substance use disorder treated. They're coming to have their infection treated, even if those two are related. And that having a PICC line in might help them to continue to manage their cravings and withdrawal and overall allow them to better participate fully in their own medical care. And I think, you know, the most important potential benefit of a PICC is that of patient autonomy. So it allows people to control their own health, their own body, their own substance use, you know, a device that is connected to their own body. Um, and I think that's an incredibly important thing that, you know, as a group, we've, we've spoken about a lot throughout these, these talks. So what comes next? Like, how do we use some of this knowledge? Um, and so, you know, as Dr. Webster mentioned, I also speak from the physician perspective, because that's my role. Um, but I think a lot of these concepts are fairly broadly applicable to all members of the multidisciplinary team. And I think, you know, when we're thinking about pick lines and people who inject drugs, the most important thing to do is to sort of weigh these risks and these benefits. You know, ultimately, there's never going to be a good one size fits all approach. Um, and I think the best way to really handle it in most cases is through an open and honest conversation with patients. Um, and so what does that look like or how could that look like? <clears throat> so Tally had mentioned previously in her talk, um, which I have watched many times now, by the way, um, that it's important to avoid thinking of ourselves as the expert. And I, I think that makes sense here as well. So, 
I think it's important to start with asking people what they know, because lots of folks have had pick lines or known folks who have had pick lines and may have their own experiences or thoughts. For folks who aren't familiar with them, I'll often like draw them a little picture and explain where in their body it goes. And I usually reiterate that this is primarily for medical therapy um, and that it does have some risks associated with it, but provide reassurance that the choice to use it is theirs and that choice will not impact the medical care they receive. Um, I will often tell people that if they do choose to use it, um, we can show them how to do so safely. And I'm lucky that I work in a place in an institution where I have lots of support for that, which may not, I appreciate, be the case everywhere. And when I say, you know, use it safely, I mean things like alcohol wipes on the hub or things like the idea of pick dead space and the need to sort of draw off before flushing and, and what flushes are and why they're important. I also very clearly document that I've had this conversation and to try to chat with their you know, general medicine team to ensure that everyone's on the same page and they're not receiving mixed messages. Um, I think ultimately the most important thing we can do and encourage our colleagues to do is to give folks sort of the support and the supplies and the space to use their pick safely if they choose to and the ability to make that choice for themselves as autonomous people. Um, I think it's also important, you know, talking to other parts of our multidisciplinary team to teach people what not to do. So, you know, teaching them that if your pick falls out, do not try to jam it back in. Um, checking in with our patients to make sure that cravings and pain and withdrawal are, are being managed. You know, that study from Tan et al, nearly half of the people admitted were still using substances in hospital, which I feel, you know, is a huge miss. And there's lots of reasons why folks use substances, but I think it's so important to make sure it's not something they feel they're being forced to do as a result of inadequate or suboptimal treatment on our parts. Um, and I think when possible, uh, it's good to provide a plan for oral medications uh, for things like, you know, pick um, clogging or dislodgement, or, you know, if the pick comes out or someone decides that they do wish to leave hospitals, so that there's no delays or gaps in their antibiotics. So to summarize, Pick lines provide you know, durable venous access for long courses of treatment and are risky in all populations. Um, the risks of pick lines in people who inject drugs are perhaps not borne out in the, liter the literature to the extent that we're worried about them. And the benefits of them are often underappreciated. Um, I think access to pain and withdrawal management and the full spectrum of medical and non-medical supports is super important for reducing any risk. And ultimately, you know, we need more research to better understand specific risks for people who inject drugs. So I know there's the inline study happening at St. Paul's, some of the authors of which I think are probably here. Um, and to answer not the question of like, you know, what are the risks of injecting into the PIC, but how can we approach this through a harm reduction and, and patient oriented lens to appreciably decrease anticipated risks. Um, and, you know, I think most importantly in that the perspectives and experiences of people who use drugs should be centered in policy creation and implementation. Um, and so I think that leaves us uh, some time for, for further questions. Um, huge thanks to, to Dr. Brothers for organizing all of this and, and Dr. Webster as well. Um, and to, you know, all of the folks who are too numerous to name who have, you know, responded to my emails and my questions and shared their experiences with me as well. Um, and I have a litany of references for those who want. And if you're unable to access any of these papers for any reason, please shoot me an email and I will, uh, I will provide you with them. Thanks very much, Vic. That was an awesome overview uh, and also with very pragmatic advice. So I think those two talks were very complimentary, which is thanks to both of you very much. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for questions and um, feel free to put more in the chat or raise your hand or unmute yourself to ask for folks in the audience. I'll just summarize and paraphrase a couple that have come up in the chat box throughout. Um, Martha Risdale has asked, has raised a couple of really interesting points. One was, um, this is a paraphrase, but focused on uh, opportunities for combining uh, addiction uh, care and infectious diseases care for patients who have left hospital, including if it's with, you know, our suboptimal management plan, or an, we're going with an oral option because people um, can't stay in hospital any longer. Um, but so what, what experience do you two have, or what approaches uh, could you recommend about combining, you know, methadone, buprenorphine, uh, addiction care with um, infectious diseases, antibiotics care for, for outpatients once they've left the hospital? Yeah, th thanks uh, for that. I, I think that's absolutely critical. And we do that as a practice. You know, if somebody, 
is on a, a daily dispensed medication such as methadone or buprenorphine, we absolutely combine that uh, dispensing of antibiotic. And the, the pharmacists in, in our community play a huge role in providing that oversight. And, and if you develop good relationships with them, you can have somebody in the community keeping an eye. And if there are problems that arise or there's issues with it, adherence and concerns that maybe the oral antibiotic plan isn't happening, then it, yeah, it works very nicely together. So I think critical to do that. Yeah, I would sort of echo the same thing. We will often call patients pharmacies and try to link oral antibiotics to any daily dispensed medications they're receiving. Um, a good number of our patients also have sort of like community providers and outreach providers. And, you know, this has come up in several other talks of, you know, the importance of remembering that people don't just exist in the hospital, that often outside of the hospital, they have these entire communities that are you know, very invested and involved in their care. Um, that are you know, able and willing to, to help make those plans happen. Oh, that's great. Uh, great thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, another question, again, raised by Martha was on um, this situation where patients are um, about to leave against medical advice as the cases were framed in Duncan's presentation. And so the infectious diseases consultants are having, are being asked, you know, what are, what should we be prescribing or how should we be prescribing it oral versus IV, IV. Um, but that against medical advice discharge may be modifiable or avoidable if patients, other patients, others, other patients, other needs are met. Um, so I was wondering if you have advice uh, for the attendees about how you approach those situations um, where a patient may explain that they need to leave hospital or aren't going to stay for the recommended intravenous antibiotic course as things are currently set up and how you uh, navigate that or figure out what might be modifiable. Yeah, again, another great question. And I think it's important to understand why is the person leaving uh, prior to the, the recommended uh, time frame? And if there's something that's modifiable, I mean, that, that needs to be identified and uh, you know, if it is a matter of poor pain control, if it is a matter of access to, to safe supply, then there are things that we can do that can allow for the person to get the care that they need, both in terms of the, the substance use disorder, as well as the, the active infection that they're being treated for. So if there are things that can be done, but sometimes even in doing that, like if so, six weeks is a long time. So if somebody's going to stay in hospital for a six week course of IV antibiotics, that, that's challenging. Uh, I know uh, I couldn't handle it. And, and then you factor in a lot of what we're seeing with, uh, you know, additional COVID precautions, people who, you know, they, they can't have visitors. It, it can be extremely challenging. So absolutely really critical to look for those modifiable issues and address them. But sometimes it's just, you know what, it's, I can think of right now, there's a young woman on our medicine ward who, uh, you know, she's been in hospital for for a bit over six weeks now and it's it's sunny out she's getting stir crazy and it doesn't have a lot to do with her substance use disorder it's it's just six weeks is a long time and she's a she's a young human being and we can't modify that so that's where we've got we've got plan a which is to try to get her through her course of IV antibiotics but but we've got plan b on the chart and doing everything we can to try to get stable housing set up and and uh, some supports in the community so that, you know, either we hit that point where, nope, the infection is adequately treated uh, regardless of PWID or non-PWID status. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can set things up as, as need be. I think too, it makes the case for um, sort of more, you know, in between or liminal spaces. And so like here in Vancouver, we're super lucky to have something called CTCT or the Community Transitional Care Team, um, which is like a, a nine bed unit that deserves an hour long talk all of its own, but uh, where folks who, you know, use substances and, and need these long courses can go and they can receive nursing care, but also, you know, they can kind of come and go as they please or their partner can visit or sometimes their pet can be there with them. And so, you know, it's, it's not quite the, um, you know, strict environment that is the hospital, but it's also not the, you know, laissez-faire thing that we all imagine when we just sort of discharge a patient, as you had mentioned, like with pills and no follow-up. So it's, you know, I think there's the case for more of these in-between spaces um, as we become more comfortable with these, these differing plans that are partial oral, partial IV, 
you know, maybe more using pick lines. Thanks very much. I appreciate you both. Um, you know, as, as Vic's been challenging us to consider the potential benefits for pick lines of people who use drugs and unlearn some of our perhaps preconceived notions coming from a medical perspective. Um, I uh, appreciate that you're both raising the potential harms that come with a long hospitalization and that all of those decisions, you know, including hospital admission is an intervention. So all of those decisions need to weigh benefits and risks. Duncan, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tommy. I, I did want to ask, it's interesting, you know, in, in my, what I think is a fairly short time as, a, as an infectious diseases consultant, I have seen my perspective on PICC lines kind of move Initially, as, as you mentioned, Vic, that concern about uh, individuals using that pick line and trying to do everything we could to, to make sure that didn't happen to having the discussion with, with individuals about how to use most safely. So I, I wanted to ask, are there good references or even videos that, that we could use to show people? Because I, I try to have that conversation, but I often leave feeling like, I don't think I really did a good job. I don't think I made them understand what I should have helped them to understand. And I think a video would be really useful for, for individuals. Yeah, I'm not aware of a video that exists, which is you know maybe a great future project for this working group. Um, I will often um, you know sort of ask for help from my nursing colleagues um, and for, from colleagues. You know, St. Paul's Hospital specifically has a an overdose prevention site within the hospital. And a lot of the folks there have received specific training and are incredibly knowledgeable about how to do things safely. And so, you know, I'm very lucky that I can ask them for help uh, and ask for their sort of guidance and input. Um, but at the sort of national or, or broader, you know, not hospital specific level, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that exists yet, but it's a good idea. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I agree. It would, it would be a good project for this group. And uh, just one final question here I want to um, uh, pose because I think it's so interesting. We're running out of time, but uh, Torrance um, asked in the chat about uh, a related question about um, the importance of providing harm reduction tools for patients with PICS, uh, but then pointed out that it may or may not be supported by the institution. And so I just wonder if you have any reflections or suggestions on people who may be looking to implement some of these strategies locally, uh, you know, whether policies exist or not or are supportive or not. Uh, what are some strategies for people to get started on um, doing this? Yeah, I, I would I would just say that it, it it's going to be so variable from hospital to hospital. Our, our hospital, the St. John Regional Hospital, we're in, in sort of a strange in-between stage where th there's more and more buy-in to harm reduction, although the the getting the policies down on, on paper or in print is is too slow. And so the nurses are in a bit of an awkward situation where there's, the culture has moved towards supporting this, but the policies aren't necessarily supporting. But we are able to get the right things into the patient room. All the sterile equipment that, that's needed, uh, a uh, sharps container for, for dispensing sharps, or, or for disposing of sharps, rather. And so when I have that conversation with, the boat, with, with individuals about the PICC line, yeah, we, we make sure that they've got the alcohol swabs and understand some of those other things about the the dead space and the flushing of the of the line etc so yeah important to have that in in place as well yeah i mean similarly here there was an ethics consult that was undertaken um, a couple of years ago to examine that exact question because there you know there are a number of, of sort of feelings and thoughts and, and ethical beliefs about it uh, but I, I think you know more and more the evidence does support a sort of harm reduction focused approach um, and I, I think that's irrefutable. Um, you know, for, for nurses, I'm aware that the Harm Reduction Nursing Association does have a position statement on it, um, which I'm happy to, to pop in the chat. For physicians, um, I don't know that any such statement uh, exists. And I know there's, you know, obviously concerns about, um, you know, as mentioned before, like, what are the medical legal implications? Um, but I think, again, really, if you're having those conversations with patients and you feel that they are, you know, autonomous and capable of making their own decisions and have capacity. Um, you know, I think Tally said before, we don't need policies to treat people like humans. And, you know, you don't need a policy to give someone, um, you know, all of the information they need to make the right decision for themselves. Thank you both uh, so much. This was a great session and uh, a wonderful way to wrap up our spring seminar series. Um, 
I want I just posted in the chat here the YouTube link where the recordings of this session will be posted soon and all the other sessions are available uh, indefinitely. Uh, so please feel free to share widely with colleagues and people who may not have been able to attend. Um, and then my email as well uh, it may take me a little while to, to write you back, but um, if you're interested in joining our working group and um, moving forward uh, with some uh, potential projects, we don't have uh, um, uh, specific things uh, lined up yet, but lots of conversations about um, potential projects over the next year. So uh, please do email me if you want to get involved. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks.